Hey, this is Evan from Stories from a Van, and this is my Nissan MV200 camper that I designed, built, and currently live full time in. In this video, I'm gonna teach you guys what you should know before you start planning your own off grid electrical system in your van. I'm also gonna share some of the experience I've gained from living in this van for a year and using this electrical system every day. If you guys enjoy this video, I'll make more videos in the future teaching you guys the technical knowledge needed to build your own system like this one. But before you build anything, you need a plan. So pull out a notebook and let's get started. So there are three essential components that make an off-grid electrical system. A way to generate power, store that power, and then consume it. So we're gonna start with power generation. How are we gonna get our power? Well, the first and best option is solar panels. Your vehicle is probably gonna be outside every day and that equals a daily source of free power. There are only two components in the solar system, the solar panels and a charge controller. The panels connect to the controller and from the controller to the battery. Once you set up a solar system, the only thing you have to do to maintain it is keep the panels clean. That's it. The system does the rest for you. On my van, I have two panels that total 200 watts, and even on the cloudiest days, I still get about 10% output, which means that even at the lowest performance, my panels alone are enough to charge my phone and run my small electronics. So our next option for power generation is tapping into your car's alternator. Every car has a starter battery which provides power to kickstart the engine. When the engine is running, there's a belt that drives mechanical motion to the alternator and that produces electricity to charge the starter battery. Now an alternator is kind of like an electric motor but in reverse. A direct current motor takes electricity and generates mechanical motion while an alternator takes mechanical motion to generate electricity. Now, the question is, how do we get your car's alternator to work for you and charge your house battery? Can you connect a starter battery to a house battery? You can do that, but it's not a good idea to directly connect two batteries like this. You're gonna end up accidentally draining your starter battery. That's why you need something in between your batteries. There's two methods to do this, either a charging relay or a DC to DC charger. On this van, I have a charging relay. That's a unit right there. It reads the voltage on both batteries and it knows when to connect the two. There's actually a lot of issues with this method. Your starter battery is lead acid and should only be connected to other lead acid batteries like AGM or gel. It won't be compatible with lithium. Another issue is that new alternators will cut off charging even before your house battery is full. It will stop when your house battery is around 80%. This is why I recommend a DC to, DC to charger over a charging relay. A DC to DC charger uses the same principle as a solar charge controller. It takes DC power from one source and outputs an optimal charging voltage for your house battery. A DC to DC charger is specifically designed to connect a starter battery to any type of house battery and it will charge your house battery fully. So overall, a charging relay is a basic way to connect two batteries while a DC to DC charger is a more effective method. All right, so moving on to our third option for power generation and that's shore power. So that basically means getting electricity from any source outside of your vehicle. So that can be a wall outlet in your garage, an RV park with electrical hookups, or even a gasoline generator. The best way to achieve this is using an inverter charger. A regular inverter, like the one I have right here, converts DC power from the battery to AC power that I can use in my van. But there are inverters that can do the reverse process with an AC to DC charger built into the same unit. This gives you the added bonus of taking AC power from anything like a wall outlet in your house to charge your house battery. So those are the three ways you can generate power in your vehicle. Solar, your car's alternator, and shore power. I highly recommend solar as your primary source of power generation. If you're gonna power only small electronics like lights, water pumps, and USB chargers, filling your roof with solar panels is gonna most likely generate all the power you need plus more. If you're going to have high wattage appliances like an air conditioner or induction cooktop, I highly recommend having all three power generation methods. A DC to DC charger is a great second source of power generation for added flexibility for any build, big or small. While an inverted charger may only be necessary if your power demands are high. For example, I converted a Mercedes Sprinter that had air conditioning, electric water heater for hot showers, an induction cooktop, and a microwave. Those are all high water appliances that use a lot of power, especially an air conditioner if it's running for hours. That spinner had all three power generation methods. All right, so let's move on to our next part of our electrical system, and that's power storage. So there's basically two battery chemistries for a house battery, deep cycling lead acid or lithium ion phosphate. 
This one in my Nissan MV200 is a 100 amp hour, 12 volt pure gel lead acid. And at this point, I've gotten used to its limitations. It's been reliable, but I don't expect much from it. Lithium batteries, on the other hand, outperform lead acid in almost all aspects, and it's the batteries I used in my Sprinter build. So why would you go lead acid? Well, up until recently, it was a matter of cost. When I converted this MV200 in 2018, every $100 spent on lead acid would mean spending $300 to get the equivalent capacity in lithium. The price of lithium batteries have gone down since then. There are now lithium batteries on the market that make it so that every $100 spent on lead acid would only mean spending $140 in lithium. That's a huge difference. In other words, there's practically little reason to go lead acid anymore, and eventually no reason once lithium is the same price or lower. Lithium is lightweight, it takes up less space, recharges faster, has longer lifespan, and now it's comparable to price to lead acid. When it comes to batteries, here are my recommendations. Don't get a 24 volt battery unless you know what you're doing. Just stick to 12 volts. If you're gonna go with a DC only system, which I'll talk about later in this video, a 50 amp hour battery is probably all you need, while something like 100 to 200 amp hours of lithium will cover most other needs. On the more extreme end, my Sprinter build had 400 amp hours of lithium because it had an air conditioner and we wanted it to have the ability to run the AC while boondocking. Heating or cooling a living space is extremely energy intensive, so if you don't have an air conditioner or electric space heater, 12 volts of 100 to 200 amp hours of lithium should be all you need. Alright, so the last and final part of our electrical system is power consumption. If you have multiple DC and AC devices, you need a way to distribute power to each one. For DC distribution, you can use a simple fuse block. This makes it easy to add multiple devices that all run on the same voltage, and you can protect each device with blade fuses. For AC, you can use a distribution panel that uses breakers instead of fuses. Breakers say, serve the same function as fuses, which is to protect your electronics from overloading or circuiting. Fuses are cheap and need to be replaced if they blow, and breakers can be reset mechanically if they trip. On my Sprinter, I use an AC panel that has multiple slots, so I can add a breaker for each appliance. In this van, the only thing that needs AC power is my wall outlet right here. It's a really basic setup with an extension cord plugged into the inverter and the other end wired to the outlet. Because this is the only AC device I have, there's no need for an AC panel. So, when you plan out AC power for your system, there's two directions you can go. You can invest thousands of dollars and build a robust electrical system like the one I built for the Sprinter. What that gives you is the ability to rely on electricity as if there was power coming out of the wall in your house, and that's incredibly convenient. But all those AC appliances are expensive luxuries. So, if you want to run AC appliances in your vehicle, just be aware that the cost increases significantly to support high wattage appliances. On a side note, there are gas and propane versions for most electrical appliances, so those could be cheaper alternatives. So the other direction you can go is say effort. No AC power and use only DC appliances. With a DC only system, you won't have to buy an inverter, you can use a smaller battery and your wire size is gonna be much smaller. A DC only system is minimalistic and the most affordable way to build your off-grid system. In this fan, most of my power usage is with 12 volt DC devices like my LED lights, rooftop fan, and USB ports. All these devices can run straight off the battery and don't need an inverter. There are far more devices that run on 12 volt versus 24 and that's why I recommend a 12 volt system. Because I ended up using mostly DC devices in my van, this electrical system became complete overkill. These cables are two gauge, and the only reason I have these huge cables for my system is because I thought I was gonna run 50 amps through them and power a 600 watt appliance. Now, these cables are more for show than for functionality now. 
Nowadays, the highest wattage of plants I use on my daily routine while full-timing in this van is my laptop charger, which is 200 watts, which is actually pretty power demanding for a laptop charger. I don't usually charge my laptop in my van anymore, and instead I work from coffee shops and charge my laptop there. This means I could have gone with the DC only system and saved money on this build. So that's my overview of what you should know before you plan your electrical system. I hope this video was helpful and if you have any questions, I'll answer them down below in the comments. If you'd like to get a wiring diagram of my ME200's electrical system, you can download it for free in the description. If we haven't met, my name is Evan and you should know that this channel is not just about van life or conversions. I share stories about my personal experience and my goal is to create community through this channel. That's why I'm planning meetups here in Santa Cruz, California where I currently live full time in the van. So if you want to join me in person along with others that follow this channel, please sign up down below to get more information. If you want to support the videos I make, leave a like, comment, and subscribe. And if you want to help support the community events, you can check out my Patreon. My name is Evan, and this is the van that's behind Stories from a Van. Take care.